start. So this is Gulab Devangan. I will uh, continue my lecture on active electric nuclei. And in my last lecture, we have, we were in this slide. So obviously, AGNs have very high luminosity in the range of 10 to power 42 to 10 to power 47 dots per second. Uh, so these large luminosity lead to uh, huge mass, more than about a million solar mass. And we also argued that the rapid variability time scale suggests so this mass must uh, must be residing in a, in a very compact size, uh, uh, which would be uh, smaller than uh, the size of the solar system or so. So such a thing, such a possibility, uh, we, we only have supermassive black holes and accretion of the supermassive black hole produces this huge luminosity from uh, active galactic nuclei and uh, from uh, uh, from, uh, in order to study active galactic nuclei, we must remember some of these numbers. I had already mentioned that we repeat the, the mass of the supermassive black holes is usually is in the range of 10 to the power 5 to 10 to the power 10 solar mass. They are powered by accretion with an efficiency eta. Uh, this efficiency is roughly about 10%. Uh, it can be higher as well. Uh, the size scale of the supermassive black hole obviously would be of the order of the Schwarzschild radius, which is given by 2 gm by c square. The luminosity, you can think of the Eddington luminosity. So usually the luminosities are lower than the Eddington luminosity. But Eddington luminosity, just to remember, is uh, roughly 10 to 38 arcs per second for one solar mass black hole. Observationally, if I have already mentioned, we uh, we observe a lot of uh, phenomena, and we need to understand in this uh, a picture of a supermassive black hole accreting material. How how this particular configuration produces various observational features in the, in the over the entire electromagnetic web uh, web band. I had mentioned that in the optical spectrum of uh, many. Uh, uh, active electric nuclei, so emission lines, both uh, broad emission lines to, with typical widths of uh, 5,000 kilometer per second, as well as narrow emission lines, typical widths of 500 kilometer per second. So how do we explain? Uh, let's see this. So at the center of an uh, active galaxy is a supermassive black hole. This supermassive black hole may, uh, may be rotating or may not be rotating. This black hole accretes material, and uh, this material forms an accretion disk material cannot directly disappear into the black hole because of the conservation of angular momentum this uh, accretion process for leads to an accretion disk and this accretion disk emits in the optical ultraviolet extreme ultraviolet region and if you see this uh, there are three uh, uh, hump kind of uh, features in the broadband spectral energy distribution of AGN and so the hump in the optical ultraviolet region, which is shown in the, the blue color, is so-called the big blue bump. And this arises from, uh, from the, uh, this emission arises from the accretion disk. Okay, I'll, I'll, we will look into a little more detail in the, the emission from accretion disk, how the big blue bump is actually uh, formed. Okay, in the, uh, in the innermost regions, uh, in the innermost region, there are this uh, so-called hot corona, essentially hot electron uh, corona with a temperature of about 100 keV. So what happens, this emission from the accretion disk gets componized or uh, component up, scattered by hot electrons in the corona and that gives rise to the power law continuum in the uh, X-ray uh, X -ray band. That, I'll get, that also will look into a little more detail. Um, now you uh, go into larger scales, then there are structures called the cold and dusty torus. So what happens, the, uh, the emission from the, this accretion disk gets absorbed and uh, <coughs> reprocessed into the infrared. And therefore we see this infrared uh, bump. This is, this is the emission, this is the reprocess emission from the, the dust torus. Okay. In near the central engine or near the accretion disk, there are uh, clouds clouds of uh, material, so, so these clouds get ionized from this emission from this accretion disk and uh, the, uh, ionized followed by recombination leads to emission lines and, and these emission lines can be observed in terms of uh, the Palmer emission lines for example, H alpha, S beta, etc. And because these clouds are closer to the black hole, they are uh, moving around this black hole and that uh, motion gives rise to large width 
and therefore this broad emission lines in the H beta for example shown here is the result of this emission from uh, this line emitting cloud so called this broad uh, broad like uh, broad line region and if you go further out where uh, where there are other kinds of clouds which are called the narrow line region clouds these clouds uh, as you see they are further away and uh, they are moving around this uh, supermassive black hole with a much smaller speed about 500 km per second and these are the clouds which gives rise to uh, to this narrow emission lines in the in the optical spectrum so why do we see in some regions uh, only narrow emission lines and in some regions with both broad and narrow emission lines so this is explained by this so called unification scheme so in uh, type 2 agents where we only see the narrow emission lines in H-beta, oxygen 3, etc., our line of sight passes through this uh, cold, dusty torus. And uh, therefore, the emission from the central region here, the emission from this uh, uh, X-ray emission as well as uh, this optical ultraviolet emission all have to uh, go through this uh, cold torus and uh, uh, optical UV, UV continuum emission is uh, highly uh, highly uh, scattered and, and absorbed and uh, and the broad line clouds are within this uh, because they are very close to this uh, the accretion disk they the broad emission lines are also blocked by this dusty uh, dusty torus therefore in type 2 agents when our line of sight is passing through this cold dust torus we do not see this broad emission lines as well as we do not see the di direct emission from the accretion uh, accretion disk X-rays, soft X-rays are absorbed, but hard X-rays penetrate through this uh, uh, dusty torus. So we see, do see the hard X-ray emission, but soft, uh, but no soft X-ray emission. Continuum, direct continuum from this uh, region. The narrow line uh, region clouds are much further away. They are not blocked by this uh, dusty dusty torus. So we have both in type two Asian uh, as well as in type one agents, We have this uh, view of this narrow line region cloud. So in type 1 agent, our line of sight does not pass through this uh, dusty torus. Our we have a direct view of this uh, uh, central engine, including the secretion disk, the hot corona, the broad line region, and uh, narrow line region, of course. So we see the emission lines from this broad line region. That is that gives rise to these broad emission lines and as well as the narrow emission line. So this uh, uh, obscuration or this uh, inclusion angle dependent uh, uh, the unification model explains this. Uh, the difference in the spect optical spectrum of type 2 agents and uh, type, uh, type 1 agents. Okay, we will look into a little more detail about this uh, central engine. So how well we understand the, the central engine? We do not, uh, as I have mentioned, we do not resolve the central in, uh, engine. So this uh, the current knowledge is uh, uh, incomplete. We do, uh, we do not have a complete picture of the agents, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, we have a model which uh, kind of explains our observations. And this model, uh, it, I have already mentioned, but the, the details of this model are not uh, very clear. So for example, the inner region where the black hole, the accretion disk and the hot corona are there, it's not very clear whether the, the corona, for example, in the upper right side so there is a black hole and there is an accretion disk and the hot corona maybe is something like in the in the central region uh, this is again <clears throat> this is not observation this is a cartoon like runs in a, in a sense so the hot corona above the disk in the innermost regions is probably confined or the hot corona may also be the base of the jet is seen in the uh, bottom right uh, uh, panel uh, figure so so the base of the jet may be acting like uh, the, the hot corona and giving rise to X-ray emission. That is also uh, a, po a possibility. Okay. So this uh, this is the thing. The, these are the things currently uh, the ongoing research. A lot of, a lot of people are working on uh, this uh, structure or the innermost uh, central agent, uh, engine of uh, active electric nuclei. It, uh, we will see here why x-ray emission is so important if you want to probe the innermost region or the central engine of active electric nuclei i had already mentioned this optical uv variable time scale is uh, roughly one to ten days and that that tells us about the size scale of uh, about the 0.01 parsec while x-ray variability is much faster if we are probing the, uh, regions very close to supermassive black hole uh, of the, this with size of, of the order of 10 to power minus 5 parsec so it, as you compare this watch cell radius with uh, this size scale inferred from X-ray variability, we are really looking very close to the supermassive black hole, very, 
uh, in the uh, very close to swash cell radius in, uh, in fact so so that's why x ray emission or x ray or x ray observations are the most suitable uh, means to probe the immediate environment of supermassive black hole and uh, now we will see what kind of this uh, uh, how well we understand the central gene with uh, using x ray observations so if you want to go into the X-ray astronomy part or how, the, what, are, what exactly we observe, let me explain very briefly. So first of all, in X-ray astronomy, we, uh, we can measure individual phot photons. We can detect individual photons and measure the energy of individual photons as well as the arrival, uh, arrival time. Yeah, and of course, the, the direction as well, if it is an imaging detector. Because we are measuring individual photons, we uh, measure flux in photon number flux rather than uh, energy flux. So the, the, uh, the spectrum then is expressed in terms of uh, this n quantity, Ne, which is, uh, which is the number of photons per centimeter square per second per kV. Okay. And uh, this spectrum, is a, the, this number as a function of energy is essentially the, the spectrum. And uh, X-ray spectrum uh, typically looks like this. This is not the, the, the observed spectrum, but it is a, a fold, so-called folded spectrum. So this is, the spectrum is plotted in uh, this unit, photons per centimeter square per second per kV as a function of uh, uh, energy. Now you see, this is the log log plot. So this is uh, a linear line like, uh, linear line like this is essentially a power line spectrum. So therefore, the, the the X-ray spectrum of agents are roughly power law described by energy to the power minus gamma, where gamma is called this photon index. And there are, of course, departures, and we will come into uh, come to those departures from this power law emission. So in the left side, there is a, the broadband X-ray spectrum for one of this uh, uh, Cipher galaxy, one is 0419 minus 577. In the right hand side, this, uh, there are uh, uh, X-ray spectrum of two uh, agents, NGC 4151 and PG 1416 minus 129. Again, here in both cases, you see the X-ray spectrum is roughly a uh, power law, but you you will also see in case of NGC 4151, there is a low energy cutoff, and we will see this kind of cutoff can easily be explained with uh, absorption in the in the uh, in the host galaxy as well as in the in in our galaxy, the ISM of our galaxy. And uh, in the case of NGC, for, uh, uh, in the case of PG fourteen sixteen, you also see some excess emission below about two kV, so called soft X-ray excess emission. We will again see uh, what exactly this soft excess. If you look into the higher the, at higher energies, you will also see this uh, this power law continuum does not uh, continue, but there is a kind of a cutoff. The, the power law cuts off at uh, two hundred kV, and we will see what exactly this tells us. So, so we, first of all, we, know, we now know that this X-ray emission is essentially arising due to the, the process called componentization in the hot, uh, hot corona. And let, let's see where does uh, this various continuum components are, uh, are there in the uh, agents. First of all, in let's say the X-ray uh, emission below about, uh, above this 10 to the power 17, 10 to the power 17 hertz or so, this is the X-ray, the spectrum, and below that, if we're starting from the soft X-rays and going into uh, XG media, so there is this component called soft X-ray excess, and then this uh, in the blues, this uh, this blue spectrum or the component shown in the blue color, that is the big blue bump uh, arising from the crystal disk. At uh, infrared wavelength, there is this uh, infrared bump which is arising due to the uh, reprocessing in the dusty torus, and uh, beyond that. For radio loud agent, there is a strong radio emission from the from the jet, jets, and for radio quiet agent, there is a the radio emission is very very uh, weak. So we will now look into this uh, accretion disk and uh, the, the big blue bump emission and the X-ray uh, X-ray emission from uh, agents. So how does this big blue bump, uh, what we observed in optical ultraviolet region, arises? Let's look into this. So the supermassive black hole is a critic material and uh, this material being accreted has, has certain amount of angular momentum. Therefore, it cannot directly disappear into the, into the supermassive black hole here and, and it forms an accretion disk. This accretion disk is uh, uh, as, uh, understood in terms of this uh, so-called uh, standard accretion disk model by Sakura and Sandoyo, uh, who gave this model in 1973. 
that is the basic model we we have of course there are uh, generalization uh, using general relativity and more complex uh, models but the, the, in the standard equation disk uh, disk model the the equation disk is geometrically thin and optically thick what do I, what do i mean by optically thick so this is matter the material and the radiation are in thermodynamic equilibrium so the disk emits is a, is a black body in the, in, the, in that sense but the temperature of the secretion disk is not uh, not uniform. The, the, the innermost region, the temperature is uh, higher, and as you move outward in the secretion disk, the temperature becomes lower and lower. And the temperature of this uh, secretion disk depends at the radius to the power minus uh, three fourth. So, in order to calculate the spectrum, what you can simply do is you divide the secretion disk in various uh, and large number of uh, annually. And each annually, you can assign a temperature according to this relation, temperature proportional to R to the power minus three fourth, and then uh, uh, write down the black body uh, expression at, uh, uh, and at, at different uh, for different annually. And uh, here, that's what is shown in the uh, figure in the in the right side. And then you sum the the black body emission from all the annually, and uh, the sum the spectrum is the, essentially the total disk spectrum and this looks like this in the zone in the uh, the bottom uh, bottom panel in the optical uh, uv region near uv region it it is essentially nu to the power one third and if you are observing this continuum so this it must be this is usually from a crystal disk and at lower end it is at a longer wavelength side this is new uh, new square and of course at the uh, uh, higher uh, frequency a shorter wavelength is exponential decline due to the wind law so that is the typical uh, spectrum expected from the accretion disk and and this this is what gives rise to this big blue bump in the optical ultraviolet uh, region so the, the, uh, of course we have this uh, big blue bump but what is the origin of uh, x ray emission this x ray emission which extends from <clears throat> let's say a fraction of a kv to all the way to 200 uh, 200 kv and the, <clears throat> this agents emit strong x ray emission usually in the form of power law hb see so this x ray spectrum can be explained usually explained in this two phase model so what are these two phases one phase is this cold phase a relatively colder phase, this is the accretion disk. The other phase is this uh, hot phase, which is the hot corona, which has a temperature about 100 uh, K, uh, KV. While the accretion disk is much, much uh, cooler, the temperature is uh, something like a few electron volt, or about 10 to the power of, uh, 5 Kelvin or so, while the temperature of hot corona is about 10 to the power 8 Kelvin or so. So what happens then? So uh, because the disk has a uh, temperature which, and it is optically thick, it emits in the optical ultraviolet like, uh, like black body. And these photons, the optical UV photons, interact with the hot electrons in the corona and they get inverse Compton scattered. Okay, so, so the repeated inverse Compton scatter, uh, scattering of these uh, optical UV photons leads to power law form of X-ray emission uh, so let's see how this uh, one can uh, explain in a little more detail. So imagine the secretion disk emission is more like a black body shown in the uh, uh, in the bottom panel. The red uh, the red spectrum here is the emission from the secretion disk. So what happens in this compensation fraction? So a fraction tau tau is this optical depth of this hot corona, and tau is usually sp uh, smaller than one. So the, the corona is essentially optically thin. So take a fraction tau and that, that will reduce to by some, some uh, amount. And this fraction is uh, upscattered by the hot electrons in the corona by a factor one plus four KTE divided by MEC square. So this fraction, the reduced uh, amount of this black body emission from the disk is uh, uh, upscattered, uh, upscattered to higher frequencies in one scattering state, you can say, and this process repeats. So therefore, every time a, a, a fraction tau, which is less than one, is upscattered to higher and higher, uh, uh, to higher and higher energies. And when this, uh, and when the energy of this photons reaches to the temperature, nearly the temperature of this hot corona, there is no no longer upscattering, and therefore the spectrum cuts off. So if you sum all this black, uh, all this uh, uh, emission of scattered. Uh, black body emission you will you will get a power law 
with a high energy cutoff and this cutoff roughly is at uh, is the temperature of this hot corona so therefore by measuring the cutoff of the x-ray spectrum you measure the temperature of this hot corona and that has been done for a number of agents with the new star mission uh, now launched by nasa this is one example of the broadband x-ray continuum spectrum of, of one of the agent ic 4329 a and uh, here you see when you put the x-rays uh, when you uh, try to describe the x-ray spectrum with the power law model and reflection we will come to reflection later so what you see there is a deficit of emission at higher energy at above uh, about 100 kb so one can uh, measure this uh, cutoff and in this case this cutoff is 186 uh, kilo electron volt and once you uh, and then uh, this uh, this deficit of emission is very well described by this uh, high energy cutoff and you can also use most sophisticated model this thermal confinization model and measure the temperature of the hot corona in this case it turns out to be 61 uh, kv and the optical depth is uh, about 0.7 so what are the, in addition to this continuum component, as I was mentioning, there are a number of departures from the simple continuum. First of all, at the lowest energies, there is a, a component called soft X-ray excess below about below 1 kV or so. And some agents, the soft X-ray excess can be very strong and can be observed below, uh, below 2 kV. Uh, then there are the large number of this uh, absorption lines, absorption features, absorption lines, as well as absorption edges. Again, in the soft X-ray band, when you go to high, uh, high at higher energies, first of all, you see this uh, one line emission, very strong line emission, uh, which is the which is due to iron, uh, uh, iron, uh, and it is called iron K alpha line. This line can be narrow or this line can be broad, and we will uh, uh, look into de more detail about this iron K alpha line. At higher energies, there is a hump kind of emission, which is called the reflection hump, and of course, at the highest energies, there are. And uh, this is a high energy cutoff at about a few hundred uh, kV. So how does, let's see, how does this absorption, this numerous absorption lines uh, arise? So this uh, spectrum is, this observed spectrum, this is a 900 kilosecond, roughly 10 days of continuous observation of one of the AGN uh, uh, NGC 3783 by Chandra X-ray Observatory. This is the high resolution grating of the, uh, observations. And you see this, uh, rich emission line. This spectrum is really a high signal to noise spectrum and uh, the huge number of this uh, uh, absorption lines it may look like noise, but these are not noise, these are the, the real, uh, real absorption lines are, and absorption features etc. in this uh, from this super, gal uh, super galaxy. And, uh, and uh, how does this uh, arise? So if there are absorbing clouds along the line of sight, to the central engine, which is emitting this X-ray continuum emission, then the X-ray continuum emission must pass through this uh, absorbing cloud, and that can give rise to this huge number of uh, uh, absorption features. And this huge number of absorption features essentially indicate huge number of transitions. Now you you remember the optical spectrum. So there were uh, a small number of emission lines. Again, these emission lines correspond to various uh, atomic transitions. Uh, for H alpha, H beta, H delta, H gamma, H zeta, oxygen three, all these uh, emission lines. But then uh, you can easily count, you can clearly distinguish between the, the continuum and uh, limited number of emission lines. But in the X-ray band, in the soft X-ray spectrum, even below one kV, you see huge, numerous absorption lines. So, so why do we observe such a large, very large number of uh, absorption lines in the X-ray band compared to the optical band, for example? Let's see. Uh, this question. This is because of the following uh, effect. So, if you consider the X-ray band, typical X-ray band, let's say 0.2 to 10 kV or so. So, in this band, the iron K cell bands of uh, various elements fall into this uh, 0.2 to 10 kV band. So, what do I, I mean by iron K cell band? So, let's uh, consider iron atom. So, iron atom. So, first of all, it can be it, it gives rise to this iron K alpha line at 6.4 kV, and uh, this is result. This is the result of uh, uh, this uh, uh, ejection of K cell electron. So that requires for neutral iron that requires about 7.1 kV, and for hydrogen-like uh, iron that means there is only one electron uh, in the ionized iron. So for for hydrogen-like iron that require the energy required to remove that last K, K alpha uh, K cell photon. 
uh, a KSL electron is uh, 9.1 kV. So 6.4 kV to 9.1 kV is the KSL band for iron. So you can imagine the, the KSL band for various elements, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, neon, magnesium, silicon, all these elements down to iron. So the KSL bands of all these elements fall in this uh, uh, X-ray. Uh, X-ray band. Similarly, the L-cell bands of uh, silicon, sulfur, argon, calcium, iron, all these fall in the uh, in the X-ray band. And even in the K-cell band, there are so many trans possible uh, transitions. And same uh, same with the L-cell band. So because of the huge number of transitions in the K-cell as well as in the L-cell, these uh, the the we see so many uh, absorption, so many atomic uh, features in the in the X-ray spectrum. So, so we can, as I was mentioning, we can uh, easily explain the deficit of X-ray spectrum in the softest X-ray band by uh, X-ray absorption. Let's see how does uh, it work. So first of all, again, this X-ray spectrum is specified by this quantity Ne and uh, power law continuum is essentially e to the power minus gamma. And here are the examples of this X-ray uh, continuum model spectrum power law, because this is a log log plot. So this is a linear line in the power law, but this cuts off due to this uh, absorption. And, see, and let's see how this uh, low energy cutoff can be produced by absorption. So this absorption can be described by obviously e to the power minus tau, e to the power minus tau, where tau is this optical depth and uh, uh, essentially is uh, sigma, this photolytic absorption cross section multiplied by this uh, column density. So this column density, though we say it is a hydrogen column density, but it is the equivalent hydrogen column density uh, due to all the all the elements. And this uh, photolytic absorption cross section is the abundance weighted cross section of all the elements. So this e to the power minus sigma e nh essentially tells us the, tells us the amount of X-ray absorption. So if you multiply this uh, component with this power law component, you see this uh, uh, cut low energy cutoff, and these signatures are due to this absorption edges due to due to various uh, element, elements. For example, about 0.6 kV, this is the oxygen uh, absorption, K absorption edge, 7.1 kV, there is an iron K absorption edge. So you see K absorption, L absorption, all these uh, uh, absorption edges. And uh, obviously this, uh, this amount of this, uh, or the deficit of, uh, or the cutoff of this uh, spectrum is a function of energy, let's say for the, for the highest column, 24, 24 per centimeter square, the, the X-ray spectrum cuts up near 10 kV. But if the column is much lower, let's say about uh, 10 to power 22 per centimeter square, then the spectrum cuts up about one uh, one kV. So, so this uh, absorption, this um, the absorption column density affects this uh, soft X soft X-ray spectrum. If it is heavily obscured, we don't have uh, we do not observe X-ray emission below about uh, uh, 10 kV. So this is about this neutral uh, absorption by neutral material. What if the material is ionized? So here, in the in case of neutral absorption, you only see absorption edges. You do not see absorption lines. But in case of uh, ionized absorption, you see numerous uh, uh, absorption uh, absorption lines. For example, here this again this power law spectrum passing through ionized material and this ionized material leaves signatures of this uh, absorption lines as well as uh, absorption edges and this uh, this the shape of the spectrum as well as the number of absorption lines and the depth of this absorption depends on this uh, ionization level as well as this uh, column density. If, for example, first of all, this uh, level of ionization is uh, uh, described by this uh, parameter called ionization parameter, which is, which is essentially the, the, the ratio of this photon, uh, uh, photon uh, number, uh, number plus divided by the number density of uh, this uh, uh, absorbed. So, so if, if this number is high, then the material is highly ionized. For example, this di, this ionization parameter, if it is uh, 10 to power 4, then uh, the material is almost fully ionized. While if it is very, very low, then uh, for example, log of xi minus uh, one, xi equal to 0 0.1. So this is almost neutral. So you can, uh, the spectrum shown here for log xi equal to minus one is almost neutral. So you don't see absorption lines, but you see this absorption edges. But for when the ionization parameter increases, material becomes more and more ionized, and you see this absorption lines and for log xi equal to one, for example, you see 
huge number of adoption lines. And that's how we, uh, we understand this uh, huge number of adoption lines in the X-ray spectrum, as we see in the case of 900 kilosecond uh, Chandra observations. So this, okay, so, uh, so we, uh, let's, we have discussed this uh, X-ray absorption. So let's see this uh, uh, soft X-ray excess component. So these are the examples of the soft X-ray excess uh, emission. So if you uh, see the X-ray spectrum above about 2 kb, this spectrum is uh, roughly consistent with this very simple, very simple power law component. But below 2 kb, there is a huge excess emission above this power law component. These uh, figures show data versus model. Model here is the power law component, which was fitted above 2 kb and then extended to lower energy just to show the soft excess components. So both this AG and Arcalin 564 and Arcalin 1044 show this uh, huge amount of soft X -ray, uh, uh, excess emission. Origin is uh, not very clear, not uh, clearly understood, but we have uh, uh, we have models which can explain this uh, soft X-ray excess emission, but multiple models, not just one model. <clears throat> then we have uh, this iron kelpa line at uh, near 6.4 kV. These are the examples of iron kelpa line from uh, on AGN MCG 523.16. And if you look at this iron kelpa line, there are two components. One is this uh, narrow component at uh, 6.4 kV. Then another one is this broad, uh, broad component. And then the broad component, the width could be about, uh, uh, in this particular case, it is uh, 50,000 uh, 50, kilometer per second. Now imagine the, the width of this optical emission lines, broad emission lines in the optical band are about 5,000 kilometer per second. While this iron kelpa line, the broad iron kelpa line is uh, 50,000 kilometer per second, or it can be even higher. Okay, this so therefore, for this broad iron kelpa line cannot arise from the same broad line region cloud, but it, it must be very uh, much closer to the black hole, and uh, and this uh, speed of the material around the black hole should be very, uh, very large, of the order of 50,000 kilometer per second. So there are various components of this line. As I mentioned, there is a narrow, narrow iron kelpa line, narrow iron kelpa core. Then there is iron K beta line also uh, at 7.05, 7 kb. And then there are this red wing of this iron line. So we, we need to understand what are this uh, the, the exact line shape, of how these the various line sets actually uh, arise. So let's see how this iron kelpa line, not only iron kelpa line, as well as uh, uh, this iron kelpa line, as well as this uh, reflection hump, how these two components arise, well, we will see, we have seen this uh, X-ray absorption, how the X-ray absorption arises, how does the energy cutoff arises. Now we are uh, looking at how does this iron kelpa line and reflection hump uh, arise. So this hot corona is giving rise to this uh, power law continuum of a broad bit power like continuum in fact about from 0.1 kb to all the way to uh, 100 kb or so this uh, we observe in the x-ray spectrum so the the power like continuum being generated in the corona is a result of the inverse compton scattering of this uh, optical uv photons is going into all directions so some of them wish to observe observe us, of course but uh, uh, a good fraction of this power like continuum also illuminates this accretion disk so therefore, now the, there, is a, there is a situation where the high energy photons, the X-ray photon, power like X-ray photons are interacting with the disk material. And the disk is essentially uh, cold compared to the uh, hot corona itself, but the disk can be partially ionized. The, the lighter elements such as hydrogen, helium will be are usually ionized, at least in the inner, regi inner regions, but the heavier elements are uh, not fully, not fully ionized. So there, therefore, this X-ray photons must interact with free electrons in the in the disk as well as uh, with the uh, with the heavier elements. So there are two possibilities. One is the compton scattering by free electrons in the disk, and the other possibility is uh, photonic absorption by uh, the by heavier elements in the in the disk. And this photonic absorption leads to this fluorescent line emission, and we will see this in a minute. So imagine you have a power like continuum, which is shown in this figure as the uh, dashed line, and this is illuminating this uh, accretion disk. So below about 10 kb, this uh, photoelectric absorption dominates. The photoelectric absorption cross section dominates uh, the, the Compton scattering cross section 
uh, into below 10 kV. But, it, but above 10 kV, the photonic absorption reduces and the complex scattering cross, cross section dominates. So, so, so you don't see this photonic absorption features in the uh, uh, in the high energy band above 10 kV. So, at low energy, you various elements like uh, um, iron, sil silicon, sulfur, carbon, etc., uh, get uh, get photonically absorb absorb photonically the, the X-ray photons. For example, the iron atom here absorbs uh, the the X-ray photons above uh, say above 7.1 kV. So that, that's why there is this absorption uh, uh, edge here. And once it absorbs, then this uh, KCl electron is ejected out. So therefore, there is a the vacancy here. So this vacancy is filled by this uh, L cell electron when it moves from L cell to K cell. And the difference of these energies between uh, K and L cell that is re that is emitted uh, that can be emitted is uh, this iron K alpha photon. And here you see this iron K alpha line here. So this scale per line is the strongest uh, line emission in the X-ray band, band. There are two, two reasons for this. First of all, this uh, fluorescence yield of iron is uh, high compared to uh, lighter elements. Heavier elements have higher fluorescence yield. And uh, the large cosmic abundance of iron also makes this line stronger compared to, to uh, other elements. At a uh, higher energy side, uh, first of all, this high, highest energy uh, photons from this uh, power law component uh, uh, get <coughs> scattered, get Compton is scattered, and they lose their, uh, their energy due to Compton recoil, and they move to lower energy. And uh, at the lower energy end of this uh, hump, because of this, uh, there is a deficit because of this uh, uh, photonic absorption by iron, and therefore this the, the absorption at the low energy end and the Compton recoil effect moving the uh, highest energy photons to, to lower energy, that results into this hump in the emission, which is called this uh, reflection hump. So this uh, line emissions, uh, line emission and the reflection hump and the, the overall continuum is the result of a reflection where uh, X-ray continuum illuminates, X-ray power continuum illuminates the accretion disk and the accretion disk reflects whatever it reflects at the shape of the X-ray reflection is looks like the spectrum shown in the red color here, which has the strongest iron line and uh, the reflection hump. Because this iron line arises from uh, this uh, accretion disk, the width of, uh, as I mentioned, 50,000 kilometers per second, uh, to, in order to account those that kind of a very high, uh, very large width, they, the, the lines must arise from the accretion disk. And when it arises from the accretion disk, because there is a central central black hole, so the black hole, the, the strong gravity uh, is going to affect the line profile here. And let's see how the, the profiles of this iron lines are affected. Uh, which are arising from the accretion disk. Imagine this is the accretion disk, and let's uh, consider two rings in the accretion disk. And uh, if, uh, the emission from the accretion uh, the disk from one of the ring, let's say here, will look like this double hump profile because the disk is rotating. So if you just apply the rotation, the Newtonian rigidity essentially, and because of the Doppler shift, you will see uh, these uh, double hump profile, the part which is um, moving towards us will be uh, the line emission will be blue shifted and the part which is moving away from us because of this rotation that will be uh, red shifted making this double hard profile and now because the speeds here are very, very large sub relativistic in a way in the innermost uh, in the most regions therefore we must uh, we, we need to apply special relativity so what the special relativity does to change this line profile from the symmetric double line profile to this asymmetric line so the blue wing is much stronger uh, and the red wing becomes uh, weaker compared to the compared to the newtonian case why this is happening so so first of all there is a due to this uh, relativistic beaming so the the part of the disk moving towards us the the emission from the, this part of the disk which is moving towards us is beamed towards us they are therefore increasing this uh, intensity of this blue wing while in the in the from the part of the disk which is moving away from us uh, because of the radiation is beamed out beamed uh, away from us and therefore the red wing the strength of the red wing reduces and this uh, asymmetric line profile uh, arises due to this special relativity and uh, uh, there is a supermassive black hole and therefore the relativity will uh, play a role and the line photons arising from in the, in the vicinity of the 
the supermassive black hole are from this uh, inner equation disk, they get gravitationally red, red shifted and the line profile changes from this uh, uh, relativ special relativity effects to this kind of thing, the, the, the line emission is further uh, red shifted. Now, if you sum the line emission from all the rings, then you will see the line emission from an equation disk, something like this. This is asymmetric, uh, double hall kind of line profile. And uh, the observations by Japanese uh, uh, ASCA mission, at the ASCA Exchange for Advanced Satellite for Cosmology and Astrophysics, which was active in 1990s. And that, uh, that uh, this ASCA mission carried CCDs, charge coupled devices, for the first time with the excellent uh, spectral resolution. That's how it could resolve this, uh, this line emission and measure the shape of the line emission, which was consistent with uh, what is expected uh, from an accretion disk. And, uh, uh, the line emission being modified by special and general theory of relativity and that opened an era of probing a uh, strong uh, field strong fields near supermassive black hole using uh, this broad iron line using the broad iron line once uh, people are now regularly measuring black hole spin and how it is done let's see uh, very briefly so in the case of swash style black hole, we are the non-rotating black hole. The inner, uh, the radius of the inner equation disk is at uh, six times the gravitational radius, uh, six rg, where rg is gm by uh, c square. So, so the line emission cannot arise below this uh, below this region six rg. So whatever line emission we observe is uh, out there, starting from uh, six rg to, to to outward. So the effect of gravitational redshift is going to, as well as the special of uh, the effect of special relativity is going to be uh, weaker in the swash style black hole. While in the case of uh, a curved black hole, the, uh, the the black hole would be rotating, and for maximally rotating black hole, this uh, the inner radius of the accretion disk it, uh, is at uh, one rg. So therefore, the line emission can arise. Uh, uh, from 1RG to 6RG and all the way to this uh, accretion disk. Therefore, the effect of strong gravity, uh, the effect of gravity is stronger in a uh, curved black hole, the gravitational redshift is, going, is, uh, uh, is stronger. So these are the line profiles expected from these two kinds of uh, uh, accretion disk around this uh, black, black holes, curved black hole and swash style black hole. So in orange color, you see the, spec, the line profile from swash style black hole. And uh, the red wing is weaker here because the line is not, the line emission does not arise below the 6 RG radius. While in case of curved black hole shown in this uh, blue, shown as blue line here, the red wing is stronger. The, the, that means the gravitational redshift is stronger because the line emission arising from the immediate vicinity of it from 1 RG to, uh, from uh, near 1 RG. So you see this, uh, the different strength of red wing. So by the, this means by measuring the, uh, the red wing or this line profile of this uh, the broad iron light, one can actually measure the radius of this inner accretion disk in both uh, inner accretion disk, therefore, thereby infer the black hole spin. So if you measure, if you happen to measure the, the radius, let's say at uh, 6 RG, then it will be consistent with the non-rotating black hole. And if you may happen to measure the radius 1 RG, this will be maximally rotating on black hole. In between these, the black holes will be rotating, but uh, at uh, lesser speed. So how does uh, the uh, relativistic affect the entire uh, reflection spectrum? So in the black uh, spectrum here, so the spectrum shown in black color is the spectrum in the rest frame of the accretion disk, of course, modified by this uh, instrument resolution uh, so here. And um, uh, the, the smooth curve here you see is this uh, uh, electroreflection spectrum modified by spatial and general relativity. And you see the clear difference between do these two cases. So therefore, one can easily identify or easily identify this relativistic effects. You can see this broad iron line, the line, the narrow iron line uh, has become has has broadened, and which can be in fact measured. Measure. And uh, below one kV, you see this. Uh, there are numerous uh, again the, the emission lines, but those are all blurred due to this uh, relativistic uh, effect, effects. And it's, so it's, uh, it uh, looks like uh, the soft X-ray excess emission, which uh, I had mentioned earlier. These are some of the examples. Is we not just from theoretical models, but we do see such uh, such features. We see this uh, broad iron line, for example, in Markin and 335. You see clearly you see this broad iron line and this uh, reflection hump as well as the soft excess. 
In fact, now it is possible to model all these pictures with this uh, reflection, a blurred reflection uh, model. This is a comparison of these observations. So this, uh, the data points are also shown with this uh, solid uh, uh, points. And then there are two models. One is the unblurred reflection shown in the blue, uh, blue color. And the other one is the blurred reflection. You see the difference. The unblurred reflection model cannot explain this uh, observed data, which includes this broad, uh, broad iron line and this uh, reflection hump while the blood reflection model describes the data very well. So this is a clear evidence for relativistic effects, both special and general relativity playing a big role in shaping the X-ray spectrum. This is uh, the, the famous uh, broad iron line from uh, AGN MCG 63015. This is the this is the first agent to, show, to, to, to be observed uh, showing broad iron line. And here you clearly see the broad iron line is extending down to about uh, uh, four, 4K, 3K in, uh, in fact here. And such broad or uh, such a strong red wing is only possible uh, if you uh, if you are observing line emission from below the 6RG radius for the Schwarzschild black hole. Therefore, this kind of a strong relativistically broadened iron line uh, tells us that the line emission is arising from below 6RG and maybe down to 2RG or so. This, the, therefore, the black hole must be highly spinning in this uh, particular case. The last uh, thing I want to um, uh, briefly mention is this: uh, uh, these observations, which uh, which verify essentially this uh, blurred reflection model. So in this case, this uh, X, this is what is shown in the X-ray spectrum. Uh, again, it is the ratio of this data to a power law model. So you see two line emission, as usual, the 6.4 kV line. Uh, with, with, with a broad broad iron line. In addition, you also see another emission line, which is the iron L line here, uh, just below uh, just below one kV. Both lines are, have similar shape. Both lines are broad and uh, similar shape. So so now one can actually use this uh, band, which has iron L line, because it, there is a very uh, high signal to noise ratio, and you use another band which has no reflection. The reflection is minimum. No iron line. And reflection emissions is minimum, and uh, then one can uh, look at how these two band, uh, bands are correlated, and uh, one can actually derive something called uh, the cross spectrum, which uh, uh, from which one can derive the time lag between the continuum component and the line component as a function of temporal frequency or the time time scale. And here is this time lag as a function of uh, temporal, temporal frequency uh, plotted here for the between these two bands. So what happens? At uh, uh, low frequencies or large times or long time scales, the the hard band, meaning that one, two, three kV band, that is leading the uh, the band which is dominated by this iron line. Okay, this this is the property of uh, Time variability on longer time uh, on longer time scale are lower temporal frequencies, but when you go to higher frequencies, about uh, 10 to 22 times 10 to the power minus 3 hertz, or shorter time scale, that means rapid variability. Then what you see is that this band with this iron L line is lagging behind this continuum component, and that is actually expected because. The, when uh, when the power continuum from the heart corona is illuminating, that means the power law photons have to travel from the corona to the disk and then get reflected. So there, in in this scenario, the power law photons should ar should arrive to the observer first, and then after slight delay, the reflected photons because they have to travel from from the heart corona to the accretion disk, then come to the observer. There should be slightly delay, and this delay has been measured. To about 30 seconds in this uh, super galaxy 1S0707. This was discovered in 2009, and this paper was published in uh, Nature. So this is the, this is um, strong evidence, very strong evidence for this uh, blurred reflection model, this uh, 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 this soft lag. And this, there is a lot of research going on at the moment on uh, this kind of uh, observations. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you for your patience, and uh, let's. Uh, Go to this uh, questions.
So if you have your questions, you can raise your hands. I don't see any hands uh, raised here. Okay, there are some questions from the YouTube channel, I think. Okay, so there is a question by Prince Sarma. What causes the corona to be hotter than the hotter than the day? This is a very good question. And uh, frankly speaking, we do not know the exact uh, exact region. But but if you uh, th there are some processes which may give rise to the corona, we we have no clear idea how. The, the corona actually forms. We have a reasonably good idea about how the X in this forms, but we do not have much idea or clear idea about the, the how does the corona, uh, corona forms. But if you imagine, uh, let's say a, uh, a particle is directly goes to the, the, the black hole, then the gravitational energy, it will, uh, it will uh, gain. The, uh, the energy of this particle uh, will reach to very high energies. In fact, uh, comparable to the, the temperature of the, uh, uh, the corona. And in the actual formation of the corona or the temperature of the corona which it leaves may be due to this magnetic uh, uh, processes. For example, magnetic reconnection may be one uh, uh, possibility. So uh, because this, there will be magnetic field in the accretion disk and uh, uh, that the reconnection event that will accelerate the particles and that uh, if the particles thermalize then they, that will lead to uh, high energy of these particles and uh, at temperatures of a few hundred kV, that is that is possibility. But but as I mentioned, we do not do not understand very clearly how does this uh, corona forms. There is another question by uh, Anudeep: uh, Why is there a sudden drop in iron uh, absorption line graph? So uh, is uh, probably ah uh, okay maybe this is due to in the in the uh, emission uh, line uh, broad iron emission lines in the red board side there is a slow decline and there is a uh, red wing but uh, in the blue side there is a uh, sudden sudden drop so this is this is due to the general relativity because general relativity leads to uh, uh, gravitational red shift not blue shift. So the photons are uh, red shifted depending on the, the proximity to the black hole. If it is very close, then the, the photons will be red shifted to, to, to lowest energy, while if they are slightly further away, there will be the red shift will be lesser and lesser. Therefore, you see the, the line profile in the red side. But there is no uh, uh, no blue shift, no blue shift of the photons due to general relativity, and therefore there is a sharp edge in the in the blue side. I do not see uh, any hands raised here. Uh, in my last lecture, there were a couple of uh, questions which uh, I had uh, a couple of questions from the YouTube channel, I think, and I have not answered, I have not seen that. So let me look into those questions and uh, answer them. Ah, so the, here are these questions by Anik, uh, Aniket Ganguly. What kind of nucleus do Milky Way uh, have so our galaxy Milky Way has a supermassive black hole with a mass of about a, a million, a few times a billion solar mass uh, black uh, black hole, well, like like, uh, like many other galaxies. But like uh, many other active galaxies, our uh, 
galaxy Milky Way is not accreting at high rate. The accretion rate is very, very small in case of the supermassive black hole at Milky Way, but it has a supermassive black hole. There is another question by Sukhvinder. So, so the question is, uh, are there any red, redshift range where Asian populace? So Asians are generally found at uh, all redshift, but if you look at the number of Asians uh, as a function of redshift, the Asian, the, this number peaks in the redshift range uh, two to three or so. So, so we have more Asians in the redshift range about uh, from two to three or so. There is one question by Kripa Ram, who is asking, what is galaxy morphology? So galaxy morphology is a subject which studies the shapes, uh, the size, the structure of galaxies, like the spiral shape or the elliptical shape or the regular shape. So the study of the shapes, uh, structure, etc. is called galaxy morphology. I think, uh, let's see. I think there are no, no other questions. And uh, I, I will stop uh, here and thank you very much for attending this lecture.